flooding on a carburetor sucks, but more than that, it's dangerous. And it makes the drivability and tuning practically impossible. So let's take a look at the reasons why it happens and the solutions to fix it. It's pretty easy to determine when the engine is flooding and when the carburetor is giving way too much fuel. But there's four main reasons why that occurs. And I'm going to talk about them in no order, but uh, certainly we we'll want to show you each one of them. And then we're going to talk a little bit about how to prevent it and some of the other reasons behind it. So uh, we'll start off with here with the first one. The things we're going to talk about today are pretty much universal for all carburetors, but today we're just going to talk about the Edelbrock and the 4150 style carburetor because, well, it's the two that I've got right here and it's easier to demonstrate on them. So the first thing we're going to talk about is the needle and seats. Now, it's really 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 common with today's crappy fuel with folks that don't put the right type or enough fuel filters on there they've got the fuel lines on and off carburetor on and off it is very easy to get garbage in there and the first thing you should check for when you get into a flooding situation if you've got garbage in the needle and seats now the yellow brock is nice because it's a two-piece that you can kind of open up take a look in there spray some carburetor cleaner through it through the passage in there to make sure that there's not more junk that's in there and, and got you know through the system and while you're at it you can take a look at the little tip to make sure that that doesn't have any issues that little tip sometimes can get a little gummy or gunky uh, and that's a symptom of the poor fuel that we have today with ethanol gas uh, it can leave behind a lot of varnish and, and ugliness that it draws in there because ethanol uh, is an alcohol so it attracts water water attracts all the other stuff that you don't want in there uh, the 4150 style is a little bit more difficult because it's an encased unit so you got to be a little more uh, diligent when you're inspecting this and you can't really get a good look at it but as long as it moves in there uh, freely, you can kind of take a look in there, uh, clean it with carburetor cleaner if you need to, and uh, just inspect the tip to make sure that it's in good condition, then that's really all you can do. But certainly, this is probably the number one thing that I see over and over and over again, is just garbage inside there. Also, too, with, with both of these, that uh, make sure that it's got a smooth motion of operation, and, and that way you'll know that... Uh, that uh, ethanol or, or you know garbage that's in there didn't restrict it at all so there's a couple of different things on that but you know not just a quick visual but uh, taking a look at all the little details make sure that the, the needle and seats operating good and it's clear of all the garbage the next thing to check is the floats now i know this always sounds kind of funny because you know it's easy it's simple to do on the 4150 series carburetor a little more difficult on the edelbrock for sure but everybody goes on 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 my floats are set right it's always a good idea just to verify it go up and down with them especially when you can do that very easily with that uh, externally adjustable needle and seat on the 4150 series on the edelbrock it's a little bit more difficult because you got to take the uh, main air horn assembly off and you know set the floats that way but certainly float level I see that very very frequently especially uh you know right when you get a brand new carburetor uh, from travel if it's been shipped uh, trust me that thing is not handled well by ups or fedex or the post office or whatever it does bounce around and those floats can bend a little bit the tabs can bend and that adjustment that's set at the factory isn't always perfect uh, by the time it gets to you so Check the float level, that's the big one. The next one's a little bit more complicated. If you are running the vehicle and uh, you've had it running for a, a decent period of time and just flooding nonstop, won't quit flooding, um, typically that means that the float is stuck open, which means it could be the needle and seat assembly, or in a lot of instances, if it's a brass float, now these are available in both the 4150 style and the Edelbrock style carburetor, it may have a hole in it. Um, now, that's a pretty easy thing to check for if it's on a carburetor that's running currently. Uh, you just take the float off, shake it. If you can hear the fuel in it, perfect. If the car sits for any period of time uh, with ethanol fuel, as most of you know, uh, the carburetors tend to run themselves dry of fuel because alcohol evaporates very quickly. Uh, and it's very easy to do that. But there's a little test that you can do at these. It's pretty simple. Doesn't take too much, and I'm going to show you how to do that. One way to check for pinholes in the floats is to do just a very, very simple test by submerging it in water 
and seeing if there's any air bubbles coming out of it. Now you just need the the water hot enough to be just under boiling. You don't want to create a lot of air bubbles. So if you got bubbles in there that start to form when you're heating up the water, uh, go ahead and knock those out of there. Again, you're just trying to see and get a, a difference in pressure. So when you attach the float to uh, something to keep you burning your fingers uh, and you submerge it into the hot water, the inside of the float will expand, forcing air out of it, any holes or cracks or, or issues that you have with it. Now, this one had a little tiny one in the seam, but I went ahead and opened it up just a little bit more so it's easier to see. But as you can tell, it's very, very, <laughs> very, very easy to spot. Um, and even if it's a really small uh, pinhole in there, this test will show you that very, very quickly. Uh, it's Again, it's not complicated. You're just get a little bit of hot water in there and get that soaked in there and down in there and as soon as you drop it in there you're going to see the uh, the air bubbles so just take a good look at it and that'll verify if you got a little pinhole leak in it now on the floats themselves one thing you can do if you don't want to do the hot water test uh, is you can soak this in a fluid overnight i don't recommend that you use uh, fuel, uh, especially not in an op open container, uh, very dangerous, obviously in a closed up shop or work environment. Don't do that to yourself. Uh, you're only <laughs> going to open yourself up to some problems. You can use mineral spirits, however. It has the same uh, specific gravity and density that uh, fuel does, and it's a really good one. Uh, we use that on fuel systems to uh, test the flow of it. It's a really good, safe uh, way to do that. So you can soak that overnight if you want to test it that way. Then when you pull it back out of there, shake it. If you can hear anything in there, it's got a little hole in it. The only other option that's out there is these nitrofill floats. Now, unfortunately, they don't make these for the Edelbrock carburetor. Don't know why. Maybe that would be an option to look into in the future. Future. But the issue with that is, is the reason why the nitro fill floats are so popular uh, is one, they don't develop those little pinhole leaks. And the other side of it is uh, pressure doesn't affect it. So if you do a blow through type application, uh, the brass floats will crush. Uh, the nitro fill ones will, will stay full or stay solid and won't crush or whatever. So those are your two options. Next thing is another very, one that's very common, and unfortunately I get this quite frequently, and that's fuel pressure. If the, the fuel is pushing up out of the vents uh, in the carburetor, if it's pushing out of the throttle shafts, chances are the pressure is set too high. Now I get this very, very frequently of folks that want to argue about it that, well, they've got an Edelbrock or a Holley mechanical pump. It says it's set from the factory at 6.5 PSI. It's a stock AC Delco pump. Uh, they know that the pressure is at 6 PSI. They don't need to put a pressure regulator on there. Wrong. Always put a pressure regulator on every carbureted system. The reason for that is it gives you another adjustment point in a system that doesn't have a lot of them in there. And being able to set the pressure to what you want it to is extremely beneficial. You will play with this quite a few times in the tuning process, if you do it correctly anyway. And sometimes setting it at 6 PSI to start with isn't the pressure that you need. Sometimes you need to go down just a little bit and the engine will continue to run just fine. So you can tune and adjust from there. But it doesn't matter what flavor carburetor you're working on. It doesn't matter what pump you've got. Always put a pressure regulator on there. And like I say, if you run into those issues where it is physically pushing fuel out of the carburetor, almost guarantee it most of the time, it's at the pressure is set too high. The last thing to consider here is heat soak. Now again, another topic we've talked about very frequently. I did a very full length video on this topic uh, to talk about all the ins and outs of it and the way to do it. But heat soak is certainly an issue with today's fuel. Ethanol boils at a very low point, uh, 180 degrees, at just a little over sea level. So you can do the math. Typically most engines don't really start warming up and running right until they're 180 and 190, 200 degrees on average operating temperature. So you're going to develop a heat soak issue, especially if you've got the carburetor bolted directly to the intake manifold. Now, typically the Edelbrock's a little bit more susceptible to this because that aluminum body transfers heat very well. Uh, the 4150 style on this Holley is a little bit different, but it still will absorb quite a bit of heat. And the only way you can do correct that 
is to block it. Now, these are just a couple of different uh, open spacers. I do prefer the wood laminate spacer over the phenolic plastic. It just does a very, really efficient job of blocking heat. I don't know what it is, the natural wood does a really good job of it but either one you can afford the other side of that is put the thickest plate you can put on there get that carburetor as far away from the intake manifold as possible if you can run a one inch then run a one inch if half inch is the only one you can run then run it but run as thick as you can it'll help isolate it it'll help all of the issues that you'll have with that especially if you go on a uh, a decent little drive get it all warmed up you're going to shut the car off for maybe 15 20 minutes go into a, a store or go in and get something to eat and then come back out and then try to start it that's where you'll notice the heat soak issues so um, this is a really good preventive maintenance one uh, but certainly when you have that situation uh, and it's run for a few minutes and it gets hot uh, you'll smell fuel vapor quite strongly around the engine engine compartment um, and you'll know that heat so could possibly be one of the things that you're fighting so very easy to to see uh, or smell um, and uh, the the isolator is certainly an easy way to kind of correct and fix that one little consequence of flooding too is getting a lot of fuel down into the oil. Now that's a big one because once the fuel gets into the oil, it breaks down the additive package within it, which means the protection of your oil isn't the same. So it's certainly a very, very good indication. So I know it's weird and, and all that, but uh, occasionally pull that dipstick out of there, sniff the oil. If you can smell fuel in it or a strong smell of it, you know you got a bit of a problem and you need to address it. So what are some of the ways you can prevent some of these issues from happening? Well, very bluntly, uh, good fuel filters is a great place to start. Now, I'm a, I've done quite a few uh, videos on filters and how to set up fuel systems, where to put the filter within the system to avoid the pressure drop. That's a great video, by the way, if you haven't seen it. Uh, the filters are a big, big place to start. We just talked about heat soak and adding an isolator plate. We talked about adding a pressure regulator to make sure you're under control of the fuel pressure going to the carburetor, not guessing what the pump is delivering to it. Last one's ethanol. If you can avoid buying ethanol gas for your vehicle, then do it. Um, it's a little more difficult um, getting to some of those stations that do have ethanol-free gas, but if you can afford to do that and if you can find it, uh, in your neighborhood and where you drive frequently, uh, that will certainly help solve a lot of issues with uh, uh, with your fuel system all, all together. Just less junk and less crap going through there. Last one's a little bit different, and that's the uh, the use of the the driven carb defender. I really like that product. Um, every customer that I've had over the past 15 years or so, or at least 10, I guess that is used carb defender in their carburetors, you can visibly tell the difference how much cleaner those carburetors are when you disassemble them. So the driven carb defender is a huge help of uh, getting keeping all that uh, crap and junk uh, cruising through the system. So those are just a few little tips on, on how to help prevent it. Well, there are the four main reasons why flooding occurs, how you can fix it, and some preventative things you can do to kind of help, uh, you know, <laughs> experiencing that ugly situation in the future. Uh, if you got any questions on this one, don't hesitate. Please leave them down below. Uh, YouTube's been acting a little funny for me here recently, so uh, uh, if you don't mind, hit the like button or even the dislike button. It doesn't matter to me. Uh, YouTube loves it all the same. Or leave a comment down below that you watch the video and uh, tell me one thing you liked about it, something like that. Uh, again, YouTube's been acting kind of funny on the engagement. I don't understand why, but uh, uh, I understand carburetors. I don't understand YouTube. So anyway, uh, I appreciate you guys watching. And uh, yeah, we'll uh, we got another one coming pretty soon. So we'll talk to you soon.